Good morning, Gabe. Good morning. Uh, I'm Sarah Posner. I'm senior editor at Religion Dispatches, and I'm here today with Gabe Irana, who is the web editor at The American Prospect. So, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for uh, having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. So, I think the first order of business is to talk about uh, The American Prospect. Yeah. And um, so, last week, uh, I guess for anyone who wasn't aware of what was happening, last week, the Huffington Post's media reporter, Michael <coughs> Calderon, broke a story that the prospect was in serious financial trouble and uh, that if it didn't raise half a million dollars by the end of the month, it was going to shut its doors, which was just shocking news <coughs> to I think a lot of people. Maybe not shocking to you because you probably had some awareness of what was happening on the inside. Yeah. Um, so there's been actually an outpouring of support. Um, uh, people have blogged about it. A lot of people are tweeting about it. E.J. Dion wrote a really nice piece in the Post about it. Um, but maybe you can give us a little background on what's happening here, because I think that even for someone like me, who uh, has written a lot for the prospect, and actually the prospect did a lot for uh, for my career, mm -hmm. I was unaware that. I, I think that everyone's aware that a lot of media institutions have um, are facing hard times financially, but I was unaware that it was that dire um, at the prospect. So I think that there are two aspects of this. Um, so one is that no Think Magazine makes money. Um, so if you look at The Nation, if you look at The New Republic, if you look at uh, the Weekly Standard, mm -hmm. um, all of these publications lose money. Unless mm -hmm. you're someplace that publishes, um, and I won't name names, but pictures of Beyonce's purse, um, or is following the latest celebrity gossip, mm -hmm. in your audience, that automatically limits your audience. And so progressive publications, think publications more generally, don't tend to make money. The ones well, you're saying even the conservative on the conservative side, they don't make money. The Weekly Standard you, was one that you named, but somebody is uh, funding it nonetheless, even though it's not a money maker. Yeah. So Rupert Murdoch was uh, backstopping the Weekly Standard, mm -hmm. and then it's recently been taken over by another angel donor. And so there are a few things about magazines, think magazines, that like the Prospect that do survive. One, they tend to have one big angel donor that mm -hmm. steps in and saves the day whenever the publication is in financial trouble. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to have really active funding boards whose job is primarily to go out and raise money for these publications. Um, and so w with the, the prospect in particular, I think a few things went on. Um, in the most immediate sense, we had funding commitments that at the last minute fell through, leaving us with an immediate need um, uh -huh. for $500,000 by the end of May, and then another $700,000 commitment for the fiscal year going forward. For some strange reason, our fiscal year starts the 1st of June, so okay. um, so that's, I mean, that, that's the immediate problem. Um, but the prospect has also never had an angel donor in the way that the New Republic just got Chris Hughes, Chris the, Hughes right. the co-founder of Facebook, to, mm -hmm. to come in and uh, be the financial backstop. Um, we have not had a, an active funding board um, for a while. And, um, and then also with, uh, with the new editor, Kit Rackless, we reinvested mm -hmm. both in the staff um, as well as in the resources given to the staff. Um, and and I noted, I mean, that was noticeable and welcome, I think, uh, as a reader. Uh, I, I think that the investment made in, for example, uh, sending reporters on reporting trips that weren't necessarily going to yield a story immediately, but were part of a longer term reporting project. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's money really well invested. I mean, I remember having a conversation with Jim Bowie about that, that he was going on reporting trips 
um, as part of like a sort of a long-term gathering string, gathering reporting project as opposed to just going on a quick trip and writing a quick story about it, which I think that it, it I think that that yields a kind of story and a kind of reporting that you don't get doing the kind of quick hit reporting. No, abs absolutely. And you can totally tell the difference between a story that has been reported for months and mm -hmm. one in which the person called a few people and then wrote a summary of what, um, a quick turnaround summary of, of what they learned. Uh, right. So recently, uh, Monica Potts, one of our senior writers, went to Kentucky and spent two months in the poorest non- what was it? The poorest non, um, the poorest majority white uh, county in the country, um, and to really gain the sort of insight that her piece is, is shaping up to to give readers, you have to spend time on the ground in these places, yeah. not just call. Um, you know, in order to tell stories, you have to get to know people. Right. Well. So was that was that a change that Kit brought in when he became editor, or was this something that the institution had wanted to um, make a change towards and brought him in to lead that effort? I think a bit of both. Mm -hmm. The institution has always the prospect has always prized reporting. Um, but until Kit came along, there was not the accompanying commitment of resources to make it happen to the, to the degree that it has. Um, and part of the reason we're in the, in the trouble we're in is that we, were, we invested smartly um, thinking that we had um, these resources available and then when the time came, they were pulled out. I see. Um, and I should yeah, because I, th I think that the prospect has a reputation for wonky stories um, and kind of more policy driven um, reporting, although that is not the kind of reporting I've done for the prospect, uh, the stories that I've published in the magazine, and it's been a while, but um, were investigative pieces. Um, you know, deeply reported investigative pieces as opposed to policy, thinky policy pieces. And uh, it seems, you know, from a quasi-outside point of view, I say quasi-outside just because I've never been on staff, but I've written, I've freelanced a lot for, um, for both the web and for the uh, magazine. It seems like there's been sort of fits and starts, like sometimes, um, you know, it, it, it wanted to go in a direction of, you know, having more investigative reporting and then that funding got pulled and then it went in a more policy wonky direction and now it seems to be going in a more of a reporting direction, which to me is not to diminish the value of, of wonky policy writing, but uh, it saddens me that just as it was going in the direction of doing these more deeply reported things, then it it's facing this financial crisis. Yeah, reporting is reporting is expensive. Investigations are expensive. And I, I do think that there's been a recent shift. Um, the magazine will always, if it continues, will always be a mix of policy analysis, think pieces, reported pieces, um, and shorter op-eds. Uh, but this... This recent change did um, was inaugurated by by the arrival of Kit Rackless, mm -hmm. uh, who is known for long form journalism. For he's known as a as a writer's as a writer's editor who uh, mm -hmm. will give writers long periods of time to deeply report stories. But so, go ahead. No, but um, but the. The downside is that it, it's a smart investment, um, but it turned out that at the last minute, uh, the resources for delivering on it weren't there. Mm -hmm. And so how is it going in terms of, I know that every time you go to the site, a little window pops up with the little mercury thermometer showing 
where it is in terms of the, the immediate uh, fundraising goal that, that you have for, from readers, which is $200,000. Um, how is it going and what's the response been from readers? The response, so we've had over a thousand people donate and both in the amounts that people donate and the fact that anyone donated at all. I guess this is part of the reason that I'm on the editorial side and not the business side because I'm like, why would anyone give money to <laughs> give, give away money for free? Um, you know, when they when they don't have to to, to get a product. Uh, but I think that it's, it's really been heartening to see the loyalty um, that our readers have toward us uh, and also how much they appreciate the, what the prospect does. Um, the, the outpouring has really been overwhelming in a way that I didn't expect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was, you know, very uh, heartening to see someone with as big a platform as E.J. Dion writing in the Washington Post to, you know, devote his space to that. Uh, this week, uh, what do you think? I mean, do you think that this uh, this particular financial crisis that the prospect is facing at the moment? Do you think it's indicative or or symptomatic of a broader issue or broader problem in funding the type of? journalism that a magazine like The Prospect does? Yes, I think um, I think it reflects the both the decline of print, which changed the economics of magazines in a way that did not favor the deeply reported, thoughtful think coverage that places mm -hmm. like The Prospect do. Um, but it also reflects a, a failure of the, the, the liberal donor class. The the individual small donations have been vital to um, to the effort, uh, and I think that we'll probably meet the five hundred thousand uh, dollar benchmark by the end of May because of them. Mm -hmm. But for the long term sustainability of a magazine, you need a magazine like The Prospect. You need angel donors, and the the liberal big donor class doesn't tend to invest long term in the same way that um, conservatives do. I agree with you, but I perennially wonder why. Why is that? I, is it that they don't get, they don't, do they not get it? I, I have no idea. <laughs> I've, I've tried to figure it out and ask myself. I mean, I guess the only way we could find out is by going to them and asking why they're not investing. Um, it's it's baffling because especially a place like the prospect which has produced so many good young progressive journalists and launched the careers of um of people like Ezra Klein like you uh like Matt Iglesias like Ann Friedman uh these are the sorts of long-term investments that that pay off that might not have an immediate impact but uh that pay off in the long term and contribute to creating a movement and the liberal donor class doesn't tend to make those long-term investments. Only recently do we have something like the Center for American Progress, uh, whereas we've had the Heritage Foundation for years and years and years. But I, I tend I look at the I look at CAP as a as it more of a think tank than a media venture, and even though it has bloggers that I think it thinks of as reporters, but very they're very much geared towards the sort of news cycle rebutting the meme of the day or exposing the lie of the day kind of reporting. Um, and so I think that the investment in something like CAP is a very different kind of investment than an investment in um, a magazine or even a web magazine, you know, thinking of the possibility that perhaps a reincarnated tap, a reincarnated American prospect might not have a print version. I don't know if that's in the mix. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that to have a robust progressive media, it has to be not just a media that's geared towards uh, 
reporting on conservatives and and uh, like I said, trying to rebut the the meme yeah, of the day, the lie of the day. But it needs to also hold Democrats accountable, and it needs to be able to do the deep sort of reporting that you were talking about earlier. Which I don't think. I mean, I think that you know, CAP is. It's a think tank, and it does what it does, and it produces policy papers, and it produces think progress, and it, you know, <clears throat> it has that role. But I don't see it being the same as a as a media entity. No, you're you're absolutely right, and I'm thinking aloud. But so places like CAP contribute to the concrete ways that the that uh, make up a movement. So they put out policy papers, they respond to conservative rhetoric on a daily basis. Investments in magazines are investments in the intellectual and sort of philosophical tradition, um, you know, what, what that undergirds the movement. And those, the, the result isn't as immediately visible. And so do you think that that's an issue for donors? And I, cause I think that foundations in particular, they like, they like metrics. They like to measure, um, what some people like to call impact. And, you know, sometimes that's hard to measure. I mean, you can write a story frequently. A reporter will write a story that has an immediate impact if it exposes some government or corporate wrongdoing. It may have the result of bringing that to bear in the public eye and prompting a congressional investigation or prompting a, a criminal prosecution if there's criminal wrongdoing involved. I mean, that happens, and that's obviously one role of, of the media, but sometimes it's not immediately apparent the impact of a story. Uh, and I think that sometimes donors want to see Im impact, but it's if it's not immediately apparent, then they get antsy or, or impatient. Absolutely. Um, and in this sense, conservatives are smarter. If you look at the New Review, um, which was founded, I think, in the early 50s or late 40s, um, that, you know, it is credited you know, over a few decades with reinvigorating conservatism and ultimately leading to the Reagan revolution in the 80s. And if you're a donor looking to give the new review, uh, the National Review money, you, um, many donors would be disappointed not to see a return on their investment, a big return on their investment for 30 years. Um, but in this sense, I think that conservatives and the conservative donor class realizes that this is a long-term game and that in addition to having to, on a day-to-day -day basis, counteract the, the rhetoric of the right, you also have to invest long terms in the long-term in these liberal institutions. Do you think that there is a sense in terms of deep investigative reporting. Do you think that there's a sense among this donor class, this liberal donor class, that there's already institutions that do that? There are, you know, the newspapers who, to the extent newspapers still have investigative reporting staff, um, magazines like The New Yorker, uh, for example, uh, there, so do you think that they think there's still institutions that do investigative reporting so there's no need to invest in a, a explicitly progressive media infrastructure that does that? I'm not sure if they think that, but if they do, I think, I think it's incredibly silly um, because you need more than just the New Yorker or the New York Times Rolling Stone GQ to do investigative pieces. And in the last 10 years, you've seen an incredible decline in both coverage in the foreign press. Um, a number of newspapers have, have shut their bureaus overseas, as well as a, an incredible decline in the investment in these long investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, so to say that the need is already filled is um, inaccurate. Right. I guess I'm, I'm just trying to 
ferret out what the reasoning might be. I feel like this story has been around for years. For years we've been talking about this. I remember Ari Berman did a piece in The Nation maybe four or five years ago, maybe not that long ago, three years ago, about the Democracy Alliance and sort of the, uh, I, I, I guess what would be the best term, uncertainty about uh, where it was going or how it was um, funding things. Um, including media, including the prospect. I think the sto that story talked explicitly about the prospect. And so I feel like we're, you know, we, we keep, we're going through these cycles of continuing to have this discussion of, well, where is the funding going to come from for these uh, media organizations? And then the, the discussion doesn't, doesn't advance the ball beyond the angel donor paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, because without the angel donor, it seems like there's not, although I guess, I mean, some people look at the TPM model, for example, which is not nonprofit, which is for profit, and didn't, didn't rely on an angel donor as much as it relied on, it relied on investors. Uh, but TPM doesn't do the sort of deep investigative reporting that we're talking about. At least I haven't seen their latest 10,000 word piece, which is not to criticize them. I think they just do something different and serve a different right. purpose than places like the prospect do. do you, but do you think that's kind of the new model? I mean, do you think that that's, it's changed the landscape of what people expect from a news organization, from a media organization, and that, that that's, that's the wave of the future, this and leaving the five or 10,000 word piece behind. No. Um, and if you look, so I was... That's good to hear. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I wonder about that. Um, I think it's every, you know, romantic journalist's biggest nightmare. Um, and I assume that you're one as I'm one. Um, but I was looking on, on Slate's website recently, uh, and their most popular piece is... Uh, I guess they have a partnership with Longform, which aggregates long-form journalism. Mm -hmm. And their their weekly sort of top hits from Longform is their most read piece. And you see the rise of places dedicated to aggregating long-form content, like Longform, like Long Reads, Byliner. And so there's obviously the demand for it. Uh, it's just the funding. Uh, the funding model hasn't been figured out. Mm -hmm. And those places can afford to aggregate this content because then they don't have to pay for it, but paying for it, places that have to pay for it, like the prospect, uh, you know, that's, that's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. So you see these, you see these long form pieces get a lot of traffic and attention. It's just that for many publications, it's difficult, as you know, our our current financial crisis shows. It's difficult to, to find the funding to do them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But well, I think, speaking of, but I think the demand to say that the the web has shifted, you know, has changed journalism such that the era of the five thousand, ten thousand word piece is over is again, inaccurate, because if you look even on the web, there is demand for this sort of yeah. journalism. Well, I think, you know, a few years ago, there was a conventional wisdom that was going around that no one will read anything on the web that's more than 12 or 1500 words. Just people won't read it on the web if it's longer than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know where it came from, but I know, you know, I knew a lot of people who were kind of repeating it. And uh, I have found that that's not true. I have found that uh, at Religion Dispatches, deeply reported four or five thousand word pieces, which we've published, do get a lot of attention, uh, especially if they're done well, if they're uh, invested with good reporting. Um, people will read it. Uh, there's, I think that now people don't really see a difference between will I read it if it's in a magazine and it's five thousand words, but I won't read it on the web if it's five thousand words. I think that that is history. Um, but I think also that we do have 
a culture, a media culture that values the rapid response. And you know, I mean, I think you saw that in the ridiculous uh, uh, playing out of who broke the story that Rick Santorum was going to drop out of the presidential. Mm -hmm primary. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. There was like a tweet and then there was this whole dissection of like, how did the tweet, and everybody knew that he was going to drop out, yeah, right? I mean, what, what else was going to happen at this event that was originally billed as a political rally and then was changed to a yeah. press conference? And then you see, you see, I mean, and it, it's funny to watch this happen because you see places not quite asserting it, but saying, you know, like this might be coming, this might be coming, and then you know, someone pulls the trigger and then all of the Washington media establishment goes crazy. I don't um, know. It was, it was insane, though. <laughs> I mean, the idea that people were worried that somebody else had broken the story, had gotten the, comfort, the absolute confirmation from the campaign that he was indeed going to drop out at that press conference, and that there were so, much, so many reporting resources devoted to, A, you know, trying to be first or not be last or not be second even. Uh, and then to the subsequent dissection of how it all happened, it was just such a, to me, it was just such a low point for our profession. It may be well, I think I think being newsy and trying to be the first to get information out there and being, you know, because if, if you're, I do think it's sort of silly and it's not the sort of, it's not the sort of journalism that is the reason I decided to be underpaid and now possibly out of a job, you know, to join this profession for. Um, but I do think that, you know, conveying information quickly um, and being the primary source of breaking news is a service that places provide. It's just different from, from the sort of... Uh, longer, more off the news cycle investigative pieces that I think there's demand for and that, you know, go hand in hand. So the prospect does both. We don't quite break political news, um, but we'll do quick analyses. Um, but I think, you know, at least in the way we're set up, we want to have a mix of both deeply reported pieces and right. quick hits. And I think that's what everyone has now. I mean, everyone yeah. has a blog where you might be reacting to something that just happened. And when Santorum did drop out, I wrote a blog post about, you know, the sort of a, the postmortem on his campaign. But I do think that um, there is this desire to be first with some insidery piece of information that I think is is making people making reporters obsessed with getting a a piece of information that in ten minutes everybody is going to have, and it just seemed really kind of that As, seems sort absolutely. Of <laughs> Although I, th I I also think that that's a particularly Washington. Thing I mean, absolutely. Yeah. The, I mean, the the competition to be the most insidery is one of the things I I find most insufferable about this place. Um, just because I because at a certain point I think it's really superficial. Um, but you see it expressed in the media culture. Definitely, definitely. Well, I want to switch gears a little bit. This was a really interesting sort of uh, meta discussion about about reporting, and we were talking about whether people. Um, read long form pieces on the web and what what pieces get popular and, and get a lot of traffic. And uh, well, your piece was also in the magazine, right? The piece you wrote about uh, ex gay therapy, yeah. ex gay therapy. Um, but it was read widely on the web. I think it was the most wide, most read piece in the prospects history. Is that right? Uh, that's right. <laughs> um. So, in any case, uh, that was that was such a great. If, if so, I would say to anyone who hasn't read it yet, uh, your piece about your own experience in what's known as ex gay therapy, but it's just uh, pseudoscientific and often religious bullshit. Um, 
uh, but you combined that, you combined, it was just this great combination of your personal experience and it was so, um, I think, brave and revealing to talk about the, these, this very intensely personal experience you had with this particular kind of quote unquote therapy. But you also combined it with some really great reporting where you basically got one of the promoters of this pseudoscientific uh, effort to back away mm -hmm. from from a claim that he had made about the scientific underpinnings of it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just wanted to say how much, what a great piece it was. Oh, well, well thank you. Um, it's actually probably the hardest piece I've had to write precisely because it was so personal. And I feel like, um, I sort of feel like I told the entire world my deepest, darkest secrets. Um, <laughs> I think you did. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, I, it, and I was really concerned about doing it in a way that furthered a point and wasn't just, you know, me talking about my childhood and wasn't just a confessional piece. Um, well, the other thing that I really liked about it, because, uh, you know, in my, on my beat, in the religion beat, there's a lot of, um, you know, the ex-gay therapy gets talked about a lot from the standpoint that it's used as kind of a religious bludgeon, which was a topic you didn't delve that that deeply into in, in your piece. Um, but I think that there's a tendency to portray the purveyors of ex-gay therapy as these unfeeling, terrible, deranged monsters. Mm -hmm. And your piece humanized them without giving them a pass mm -hmm. on what they've done, particularly the therapist that you had as a teenager uh, but you made him seem like an actual human being and I think at one point described him as warm mm -hmm. warm and irreverent I think mm -hmm. was the description and I think that that was really valuable because I do think that there's a tendency to portray them in very black and white terms and it just gave an insight into how people can get sucked into this sort of thing, that it's not always a religious bludgeon uh, that might cause somebody to be, um, <sighs> cause them to fall, fall into this and not be able to get out of it or, or, or disentangle themselves from it, mm -hmm. uh, but that there are other ways that people um, get sucked into it and feel like they can't get away from it. Yeah. And I think that your piece described that really well. Well, thanks. And the truth is that, I mean, the world is a complicated place, and very, very seldom do you have just an unmitigated um, villain. Uh, and I, and so I did try to convey that people who do escape therapy, people who um, advocate for it, many of them, I won't say it's. Uh, true of everyone, because I think some people are motivated just by disgust with gay people and yeah, that's true. You know, hatred of gay people and disgust with homosexuality. But there, there, there is a you know a, a subsection of the overall group that you know advocates for ex gay therapy uh, that really thinks they're helping gay people and. You know, however misinformed, however misinformed they might be about the causes of homosexuality or the, the supposed harm that homosexuality does, they are. I, I think one. I think you have to be fair to them, and I mean, point out that you know while they have views that stem from misinformation. Um, you know, they aren't necessarily evil, nasty people. Um, mm -hmm. And in a way, I think, you know, as you said, I think that makes it more compelling. Right. Yeah. Um, well, let's segue from that into how um, LGBT issues are actually be 
beginning to play a role in the presidential campaign. I think that for a while the conventional wisdom was, oh, well, gay marriage, nobody said that's not going to be an issue. There aren't enough people who are opposed to gay marriage to make it an issue in the presidential campaign and the economy and foreign policy, et cetera. Uh, but then last week we saw the resignation of Rick Grinnell from the Romney campaign, apparently under pressure or at least um, uh, some kind of duress from anti-gay uh, conservatives. And then yesterday we saw Vice President Joe Biden express his, how did he say, he's comfortable with uh, same-sex marriage. And then this morning the White House kind of scrambling to make sure that he wasn't expressing Supportive. any White House policy yeah. there. He was just talking off the cuff. So let's deal with the Republicans first. Are the Republicans even ready to, I mean, it's, it seems, you know, on the one hand, you have, you know, Ken Melman, the former chair of the DNC, has come out and is openly gay. And then you have someone like Rick Grinnell, who's had a successful career in the Bush administration, is admired by a lot of foreign policy, national security conservatives for his skill in that area. Yet, and the Romney campaign was willing to hire him, knowing that he was gay, knowing that he's publicly supported gay marriage. And yet they seemed to recoil or cower in the face of really a handful of religious right uh, leaders publicly uh, excoriating Grinnell, in particular for his position on, on marriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, when is the Republican, is it the Romney, is, do you think the Romney campaign is just being wimpy or do you think the Republican party is not ready to have a gay person as a major spokesperson for a presidential campaign, even though everybody knows that there are gay Republicans and gay staffers and a gay former chair of the RNC. I mean, I think it's hard to describe Mitt Romney as anything other than a wimp. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, at the slightest hint of controversy, or you know, the, you know, he'll like correct himself for the slightest deviation from the conservative, you know, conservative you know, extreme right-wing orthodoxy. Uh, because at heart we all know that Mitt Romney is not the not the um, insane right-wing conservative that he pretends to be. I still think, as my colleague Jamel Bowie has pointed out, that he would govern that way in, in order to keep his base happy. But, you know, it, he was governor of Massachusetts, uh, he, you know, it's it's very obvious that he is kowtowing to the the right wing of the Republican Party, and in the uh, in the instance of Grinnell, to um, the religious right um, wing of the Republican Party. As for the question of whether Republicans are ready for, are ready to have, you know, and it's like a, a gay foreign policy advisor. Um, you know, it's not even a gay presidential candidate or, yeah. you know, a gay, you know, president of the Republican National Committee. We're talking about a, an advisor to their presidential candidate. I think the answer is some of them are and some of them aren't. And I think the entire episode reflects the, the split, the divisions within the Republican Party. You have the, the pro-business Wall Street crowd that is relatively comfortable with gay people and gay marriage and and then you have the conservative um, the social conservatives who are not yeah I mean I think that for the religious right in this particular instance I think that they used this episode to really continue to put the screws to Romney mm -hmm. They have long complained that they don't think he's a trustworthy messenger, so to speak, of their issues. You know, he's flip-flopped on abortion and same-sex marriage, which he has. Uh, and I think that they continually want to remind him that he has to work really hard for their support. 
that, yeah, they're beginning to come around because he's the last man standing, but they clearly didn't want him all along. And they were able to use the fact that Grinnell had publicly supported uh, same-sex marriage as a further device to pressure Romney. In that, it wasn't just that Grinnell is gay, it's that he has taken a position that's contrary to their position and contrary to the position <clears throat> that they've pushed Romney to take. Uh, so Romney at one time supported marriage equality, but now he's been pressured by them to be opposed to it. And they were able to play the Grinnell appointment as, Oop, are you really loyal to us? Because you're putting this guy out here who publicly supported marriage equality. So, um, so I think it was, they were able to play it in a way that, I mean, even though it was obvious to anybody with open eyes that they were unhappy because he was gay yeah. or is gay. Uh, but I think that they were able to play it in this way that seemed, made it seem like a, perhaps a little less, less about him in particular and more about his, his stance and what it said about conflicting with the position of the, of the campaign, the official position of the campaign. Absolutely. But, um, and so there's been a lot of talk this election cycle about how social issues have taken a backseat and economic... Never! Yeah, I, <laughs> that's, that's what I think. Um, and economic issues are really what concerns everyone. I think that that's generally true of the electorate. Um, but there is still the, the socially conservative wing of the Republican Party. And this was, this was really an assertion of their power. Um, yeah. It showed their influence. And Mitt mm -hmm. Romney could have just as easily, you know, I, it, it's hard to know what went on, what the discussions were within the campaign, but he could have just as easily kept him on and showed that, in fact, this was about, this election was about economic issues. Um, but he, or about foreign policy, at least. Yeah, exactly. Um, but he would do that at the risk of of, uh, of upsetting this key constituency in the Republican Party. Uh, so, again, because I think he's a wimp, he, um, you know, he gave in, the campaign gave in, Grinnell had to leave for personal reasons. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah. So, but, you know, speaking of wimpy, uh, <laughs> so, you know, yesterday, uh, as we taped this yesterday, uh, uh, Joe Biden was on Meet the Press and, and, and talked about being perfectly comfortable with uh, same-sex marriage. And then we saw this morning the administration walking it back and saying this kind of odd thing that, well, we don't, it, it was sort of like, well, we haven't, uh, we haven't defended the Defense of Marriage Act in 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 court, so it's not like we're trying to walk anything back. Yeah. But also, we're not walking anything forward either. Right. It was it was this really strangely parsed response, and also a very deliberate effort to say we Biden not was not yeah. speaking of you know wasn't speaking for administration policy. So Obama's uh, the Obama administration. I mean, the president's position on same-sex marriage is that his views are evolving. That's the official position. <laughs> I don't think anyone believes that. Um, I mean, I I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody on on the left who doesn't actually think that Obama supports same sex marriage. Right. But what does he hope to gain? That's the part that I have have I, struggled to understand. I think he's hoping not hoping to gain, but hoping not to lose. Um, well I think that, you know, he I think he's very uh, I think perhaps him individually and and some of his advisors are very skittish about the reactions of religiously conservative voters. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd see how hard he's worked. In the OA campaign, I think they had a hope of trying to peel away more conservative evangelical voters. Um, you know, he's worked hard to appease the Catholic bishops in the contraception battle, although they're apparently not appeasable. Um, and he maintains relationships with what the administration has called spiritual advisors like Joel Hunter, who is what he likes to call a different kind of conservative. He's a, he's a pastor from Florida, 
um, but you know, still remains opposed to same-sex marriage. And but I just I don't understand the the value. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think it's about independence and not scaring away independents who might see his support for same-sex marriage as radical. Mm -hmm. um, and the truth is, while... Do those people exist? Uh, they do. I mean, they don't exist in places like Washington, D.C., um, you know, New York, but, L.A., on the, on the but, coast. But somebody who... So, so how, someone whose vote would be changed... You know, they're, they're otherwise for Obama, but then when he comes out for same-sex marriage, though, they'd say, uh, -uh I'm going to vote for Romney. I mean, I don't think it's I don't think it's that clear cut. I mean, I don't think mm -hmm. that voting it's part of the mix. Yeah, a lot of voting isn't that rational. I mean, it, it would probably behoove the country if it were. Um, <laughs> but I think that it, you know, it. I mean, whether whether people acknowledge it or not, and I think that there were, there are many people across the country who while they might not hate gay people, um, they're uncomfortable with same-sex marriage. Um, and so, you know, it might not direct, they might not say, well, I don't want gay people getting married, but I think that, you know, it, it could have an effect. Um, but we see through Obama's uh, statements that we don't believe his views are evolving. We believe he's for marriage equality. Yeah. So don't those voters see through it too? Um, no. I mean, it, it seems transparent to me. I mean, it does to me too. But the the truth is, uh, most most Americans have not been following um, the primaries like you and I have. They they're not as politically engaged. Um, the majority of people, and I always use my parents as, you know, the proxy for the average American, will, <laughs> you know, will tune in two to three weeks before the election. And that's when, you know, they make any sorts of decisions. And so I, I don't think that they, you know, this isn't a knock against them. They're busy people who aren't particularly interested in politics, but they, you know, they, they don't think deeply about, you know, how... How genuine is this person? Um, mm -hmm. You know, is you know, is Obama really telling the truth when he says this? Uh, I mean, I think that you know, we, you know, you and I know his history, his background, and his evolution slash, you know, not opposition, but not um, support for same-sex marriage doesn't make sense in the context, you know, of who he is as a politician. Um, and who he is as a person is and, and previous yeah. statements that he's made on the issue. Um, but I don't think that most people examine it that closely. Right, right, that's true. But at the same time, when you look at the at the polling data, and I know that you know this is when campaigns look at this, they're looking at it far more granularly and in states that are up for grabs and so on and so forth. So national data isn't that. Um, useful to them, but I mean, just looking at it as a as a person and not as a as a campaign strategist, you know, you see the trend, the public opinion trend is very much in the direction of supporting same sex marriage. And then when you further break it down religiously, the only religious group left that has still has a majority opposing it are white evangelicals. Uh, so. It seems like for Obama, it, it just, I guess I understand, you know, what you're talking about from a campaign strategy perspective, but it also seems like from a legacy perspective, he's going to, he's just behind the, he's not only behind morally, but he's behind the public opinion trend. Yeah. I yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think if he gets reelected, he'll come out for same-sex marriage. <laughs> well, then it will be very easy to do that. Of course. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it would also... I mean, then again, it might not be as, as useful to us if he comes out for same-sex marriage now. And I'm not saying that this would necessarily happen. If he comes out for same-sex marriage now and then doesn't get reelected. <laughs> um so I, right. 
I think that... But I mean, that, you know, you'd never be able to tell whether that was the reason. Yeah, you wouldn't. Um, yeah. So as cynical as it sounds, I think you have to play the game in order to change the game, uh, which is also why... So a lot of people criticized Obama for um, going back on his word when it comes to uh, campaign finance for, um, you know, cooperating with super PACs, um, you know, with... Uh, so there are members of the White House administration that are uh, going to do fundraising for his super PAC, and people criticized him for giving into the Citizens United, um, you know, the, the post-Citizens United, like, funding regime. And I, I made the point, well, what's the point if he opposes it and then has no money and doesn't get reelected? Which again is, is cynical. I mean, and I I I am just as frustrated as um, a lot of other gay rights supporters I know. Where I just wish Obama would say it because I think that you know having the president of the United States say that he supports same sex marriage, you know, is sends a signal to the culture that this is something that is not deviant and weird, um, you know, but will help accelerate the trend. That we've seen, um, you know, over the over the last ten years, but especially over the last like two or three years, in support for same-sex unions, both both civil unions and marriage, um, and same-sex marriage in particular. I also feel like by prevaricating on it and putting out the sorts of statements that they did today, it's even apart from whether coming out for it would be right or wrong. Mm -hmm. It just sends a very, uh, it sends a sort of signal that I'm trying to avoid, I'm trying very hard to avoid taking a position on this. Mm -hmm. And I think that to voters, that lack of decisiveness could be more off-putting than taking a, taking a position. And maybe he thinks he's taking a position that he's, still evolving and, and, and is for uh, equality and equal rights, but not for marriage. Like that's where he draws the line because of his religious beliefs or something. But I just, I think it just makes him look, it makes him look like a politician. Yeah, <laughs> I, I agree. I, I think that, and I think that whether it's wrong or right, um, and again, I, I sort of feel ambivalent about this. On one hand, I recognize why they're not coming out in favor of same-sex marriage. On the other hand, I really wish the Obama administration would and have been really critical of them for not having the courage to do so. Um, I, yeah, I, I think that they've made the, the calculus, I mean, their calculus is that it would do them more harm to support same-sex marriage than to risk seeming, to risk seeming indecisive by, you know, right. evolving on it. Well, when you look at North Carolina, you know, you know that that's a state that they're looking at, that the campaign is looking at. Yeah. Uh, and you see what's happening there with the referendum that's being voted on tomorrow, mm -hmm. tomorrow as we tape this. Uh, and some of the, and it seems uncertain, well, it could, I guess, it could go either way, but it looks like it could possibly pass. And when you, it's, uh, it's troubling though. It's very troubling to me that when you look at some of the really extreme rhetoric of some of the people supporting the referendum in in North Carolina, which would ban not just marriage but civil unions and other, um, I'm not sure what other things are there there are but I guess domestic partnerships uh, yeah, it's and gross. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, so uh, it's it's it just seems you know to not take us so have they have have they taken a stand on that that referendum in particular they have they have okay. uh, so they the Obama so they're opposed to that mm -hmm. right okay so that's good yeah <laughs> um, uh, no but in, in general I think that um, you know, the, I mean, it, it's like morally cowardly to, you know, be indifferent in the face of, you know, discrimination against gay people. And I think when it comes to, you know, 
when it comes to marriage equality, while in specific instances, as in North Carolina, the Obama administration is willing to say, I don't support this, um, they won't sort of make the big moral argument that discrimination against gay people is wrong. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, on, you know, on a personal level, you know, on a moral level, I mean, I find that abhorrent because I, you know, I, I mean, I am gay, I can go gay people, I care about gay people, and I, you know, I see the sort of effect that, you know, this discrimination, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, people might not see, you know, same-sex marriage as discrimination, but, you know, as overt discrimination, uh, I happen to, but, you know, the, the cumulative effect of <clears throat> all of these laws that, for instance, um, I mean, in most of the country, you can be fired for being gay, you can't get married, you know, send the signal. Um, and it's a signal that, that gay people really feel that you are not equal and you are not part, you know, like you are not, um, you know, a valued member contributor to society. Mm -hmm. um, and in various ways, our institutions send that signal and it, it trickles down and it really does affect gay people. And while there has been progress, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, and you know the administration not defending DOMA in court, at the same time, it's not, it's, it's like uh, little, little bits and pieces and then, like you said, not making the broader, big, big moral argument. Yeah, and so I think that there are, you know, so, so I'm sort of, and I, I really don't mean to, to give the Obama administration a pass. Um, I mean, I'm sort of speaking as, you know, somebody who's analyzing, you know, their political calculus, but mm -hmm. I think for people who support gay rights, you know, the best thing to do is to be mad <laughs> and put pressure on the Obama administration to move forward. And I think because of the, of the pressure, the the gay rights community put on the administration. That's why you have um, you have the Obama Justice Department um, declining to defend the Defense of Marriage Act, which they were criticized over and over for uh, for you know for initially defending it. And I think because of the criticism, they scaled back mm -hmm. and, and decided mm -hmm. not to defend it. Um, so I think you know the gay rights community. And not not just the community, but people who care about equality have to continue to put pressure on uh, both the Obama administration and and um, you know other government officials to support um, marriage equality and gay rights. Uh, but you know, from like the cynical, you know, like political standpoint, I can see the reasoning behind what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, thanks a lot for talking today. Oh, thanks for, thanks for having me. It was a good discussion. Thanks. Bye. Bye.